when we turn back to that uh, passage that we read in Isaiah chapter 38 and 39. The subject that we want to look at uh, this morning, or the title for the message is Death, Life and Folly, which in itself is an outline of uh, this passage, uh, these two chapters, which as we have already said, are really one uh, passage, one chapter. Be careful what you wish or pray for. In these two chapters, we will consider that lesson uh, as we see the experience of one of the greatest kings of Israel and yet uh, commits a, a great sin before the Lord. In these two chapters, we shall consider three things. The message to Hezekiah of his impending death, his plea for a lengthening of life and his prayer granted, and then his folly regarding the king of Babylon and the treasures of the nation. The passage breaks down into three sections. We have verses 1 to 8 of 38, Hezekiah's situation and salvation as stated by Isaiah and then in verses 9 to 22 his circumstances that is Hezekiah's circumstances in his own words and then in chapter 39 his folly and the consequences so first of all in chapter 38 verses 1 to 8 Hezekiah's situation and salvation as stated by the prophet Isaiah we notice first of all the timing of all this it says in verse 1 in those days what days the same time that the king of Assyria was threatening the nation which is referred back to in the previous two chapters again the lesson here is obvious the Lord can bring multiple trials into our life uh, and at the same time we are to trust in him we're to trust in him for the outward afflictions and the inward afflictions which Hezekiah is an example of in this passage afflicted outwardly by Sennacherib king of Assyria afflicted afflicted inwardly by this disease that at least apparently would lead to his death we see this also, don't we, in the life of Job. Job's afflictions were not just singular. They were not just one here or there. There was multiple and coming like waves of the sea, one after the other, upon the life and soul of Job. And for the believer, there will be times when there will be affliction and maybe multiple afflictions in our lives and the lesson is that we must trust in the Lord all the more at these times of affliction at these times of testing indeed another lesson that we can learn from this passage is that as the principle of scripture says that men who will not necessarily fall at the um, assaults of men will fall at their acceptance or their um, blessing if you like and we see that in Hezekiah in these chapters in fact chapters 36 to 39 form a sort of a, a bridge between the first 35 chapters of Isaiah and the last 27 uh, chapters of Isaiah dealing with the life of Hezekiah secondly we notice the message from the Lord in verse 1 Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Of course, this is the revealed will of God and not the secret will of God. The secret will of God or the decree of God would be, of course, that Hezekiah, because he prayed, would live a further 15 years. So we have the revealed will of God here. The revealed will of God can change. The secret will of God will never change. But how would you react to such a message? A sobering one indeed. 
how would you react? What was Hezekiah's response? We see that in verses 2 and 3. We see his action. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. No one else in the world he could turn to. And it's a normal response in the situation. He turns towards the wall. I sometimes wonder as I read this verse, is there a, would the Jews use this as a, as a, a defense for the, the actions of the wailing wall, the way they turn towards uh, the wall in Jerusalem and pray? Maybe they do. This was the same wall, possibly, that Rabshakeh had spoken against when the, the people were on the walls and Rabshakeh speaks to them in the uh, language of the Jews. Now, Hezekiah turns to the wall and seeks to the Lord, seeks the Lord and prays unto the Lord. And then we see his prayer in verse 3. He said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, not that God ever forgets, but this is uh, seeking the Lord's not just remembrance, but seeking the Lord to take action based upon his words. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. Notice the confidence, not a vain human confidence, but an honest uh, acknowledgement of his relationship to the Lord. And he's able to come before the Lord and to say this without embarrassment, to say this without shame. I wonder, could we do the same? I wonder, could you pray this prayer? Could you say, Lord, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight? And Hezekiah wept sore. It's a short prayer, isn't it? Not many words, not a long drawn out prayer. The Lord Jesus said to the Jews that you think you will be heard for your much speaking, for your many words. Not a lot of words, but a lot of heart. His heart was totally engaged in this short, but meaningful and earnest prayer. And Bunyan says that, doesn't he? Better that our heart be without words than our words without heart. Somebody has commented on this, that part of the reason for Hezekiah's prayer is that at this point he had no heir. He had no son to replace him on the throne of Israel. That would not happen for another 12 years with the birth of Manasseh. And it's interesting that the extra 15 years would give time for Manasseh to be born. Then fourthly on this first section, we see the Lord's response to Hezekiah. Notice first of all the means, it's by Isaiah. The, then came the word of the Lord, verse 4, to Isaiah saying, and then the message. And the message has two, at least two ideas. First of all, there's comfort, verse 5. Go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, the Lord identifies him, Self as the God of David, thy father. The implication being, as I was faithful to thy father, so I will be faithful to thee. And the comfort also in the statement, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Again, God hears everything. God sees everything. But these words mean, I am going to take action based upon what you have prayed to me. The promise then comes at the end of verse 5. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years, and I will deliver thee, verse 6, and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And then we see the manifestation or the sign. So the means by Isaiah, the message of comfort and of promise, and now the manifestation or the sign in verses 7 and 8. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he had spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees 
by which degrees it was gone down. Now we know from Second Kings chapter 20 that this sign was given as a result of Hezekiah seeking the sign. And we read in that uh, passage in, in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 10 that it's a light thing for the, the sun to or the degrees to go forward uh, 10 degrees uh, but humanly impossible for the shadow to return backward 10 degrees. And so the Lord gives this miraculous sign of the degrees going backward 10 degrees. Then what we have in verses 9 to 22 is the same circumstance, but now from Hezekiah's own words. So we have verses 1 to 8, the, the outline of, of the, as we would normally have from Isaiah, and now from Hezekiah's own words. And in verses 9 to 22, we have Hezekiah's own words from the context of his sickness in verses 10 to 19, and then in the context of his recovery in verses 10, 20 to 22. So first of all, in verses 10 to 9, when he was sick, he mourns a short life in verse 10. I said, uh, in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. Sorry, I should have mentioned verse 9 is the outline, isn't it, of the, of the verses 10 to 22. So he mourns a short life. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue or the rest of my years. So we do mourn a short life more than we mourn. Death is always uh, a reason to mourn. But when somebody young dies, and we've all known people who have died tragically young, whether in their 20s and their teens, or even in infancy. And here Hezekiah mourns the shortness of his life as he sees it. But then secondly, he mourns the loss of fellowship with God among his people in verse 11. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord. Again, he's speaking from a human point of view. He's not saying I'm not going to heaven and I won't be with the Lord. That's not what he's saying, but he's speaking from an earthly, a bit like Ecclesiastes, speaking from an earthly point of view. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. He's mourning that fact. And this teaches us that the believer is not to be an ascetic or in the sense that aloof to the, to the pains of, of life and death. That we're not to have this sort of almost carefree attitude. Oh, well, I'm just going to die and go to heaven. That's not to be the attitude of the believer. And we, we see this lesson with Hezekiah. That he genuinely mourns the loss of this fellowship with God among his people on earth. We sang Psalm 23, and, and this is about what the Lord does for us in this world. And, and when we, we leave this world and leave this life, there is a loss. There's a real loss, of course. We gain much more, but there still is loss. And then thirdly, he is in fear, as this is the Lord's doing. Verses 12 and 13, in fear, as this is the Lord's doing. Verse 12 says, He, the end of verse 12, He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night. Will thou make an end of me? This is what the Lord is doing, He sees. Again in verse 13, So will He break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. See, for the believer... We see God in all things, in the good and in the bad. God is in control of all things. God ordains all things. And Hezekiah understands this, that this is the Lord's doing. And therefore, he's coming to the same God. He's coming to the God who ordains evil and seeking good. And that's, of course, an important principle for us. That the God with whom we have to do is the 
ordainer of all things. The God who slays us, as Job says, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. It's the God who slays us who is also the God who saves us. Fourthly, he prays for God to intercede for him. Again, praying to the same God who is slaying him to intercede. O Lord, verse 14, I am oppressed, undertake for me. O Lord, I am oppressed. And he's, he's saying that, that God is the originator of this oppression, and yet he's seeking the same God for undertaking for him. And that's the biblical balance. It's not that there's some uncontrollable event happening and he's running to the Lord as a, as a desperation. No, no, he sees that God is the one who is in control of all these things and therefore God is the one who is able to help him. What shall I say, verse 15? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. God has done it. And therefore it's the one who does it is the one who can help. If God has done it, God can undo it. That's the point. The same God who ordains the evil Sam, or sorry, Isaiah 45 verse 7 and Amos 3 6, the same God who ordains the evil is the same God who can deliver from the evil. That's a really foundational principle in our dealings with the Lord. We don't have a yin and yang situation. We don't have, you know, um, uncontrollable um, circumstances. No, God is in control of all things. God is sovereign. God is in control of all things. God ordains all that comes to pass. Hezekiah knows that, and therefore he seeks this God with whom he has to do. And then fifthly, his plea to know if God will heal him. The same God who afflicted him. Verse 16. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. It's a question and a confession. His trust is in the Lord. And then, sixthly, we see his great comfort in the forgiveness of God to his soul. He comes to God in verse 17 in the context of God's grace, in the context of God's mercy. He says, For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I'm I'm seeking this God. I'm seeking thou, Lord, because thou art the God who has delivered me and has cast all my sins, has forgotten thee. The, The phrase here, cast, My sins behind thy back is the idea of forgetting my sins. God, in the real sense, doesn't forget anything. But it's the the act of forgetfulness. It's the action of forgetfulness. God will not look at our sins. God will not treat us according to our sins. And this is the great comfort for Hezekiah as he comes to the Lord. That the God who has forgiven him all his sins is the God who can also heal him. And then we see seventhly on this part, his argument and reason for wanting for wanting to continue to live, not to live for himself, but for the glory and honor of God. And we see that in verses 18 and 19. The grave cannot praise thee. Again, speaking from an earthly human point of view, not that His spirit will not go on living after, which some would point to this verse and seek to make it to say. But that's not what Hezekiah is saying. He's speaking purely from earth's perspective. The grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. A dead body cannot praise God, cannot trust God. It is dead. The living, the living, he shall praise thee. And Lord, my prayer is that I will go on living in this world so that I can praise and worship thy great and holy name. As I do this day, the Father to the children shall make known thy truth. And this brings in the inclusion of the air, doesn't it? The Father to the children shall make known thy truth. Lord, give me an heir, give me a son to sit on the throne of Israel. 
so that I might communicate my truth and thy truth, I should say, to him. And then in verses 20 to 22, we see Hezekiah's uh, statement when he, in the context of his recovery, especially verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is now that God has forgiven, that God has cleansed, that I have promised to praise, and I will not renege on this promise. All the days of our life, we will praise the Lord in his house. And then verses 21 and 22 really go back to the previous idea uh, about the the lump of figs, the plaster, and Hezekiah seeking the sign. So it's not chronological. It's a sort of a going back uh, to that uh, context. And then thirdly, we see his great folly and the consequences. His great folly and the consequences in chapter 39, verses 1 to 8. The first thing we notice is the friendship of the king of Babylon. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And then Hezekiah's folly. Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and so on. Get the point here. Remember with the king of Assyria, he would not enter. There would not be one arrow fired into Jerusalem. The king of Babylon, by friendship, achieves everything that Assyria could not achieve by threatening. It's a powerful lesson, isn't it? The king of Assyria could not send one arrow into the city. And the king of Babylon, by showing friendship, gets to enter into all the places and see all uh, the riches of Hezekiah, of God's house, of the nation, and so on. There's a big lesson here for us. Friendship with the world is enmity towards the Lord. As we said earlier, Many will fall at the the smile of the world, of the friendship of the world, who will not fall at its threatenings or frowns. So all the armor was shown, all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. It's, It's an astounding act, isn't it? Why did Hezekiah feel the need to do this it's actually slightly beyond comprehension there was no need he could have simply responded to the king of babylon appreciating his letter Uh, it says sent letters and a present to hezekiah hezekiah felt under some obligation but there is no obligation There's no obligation for the people of God to do such a thing. We are not to have fellowship with the world in the way that we only are to have fellowship with God and his people. This is not to say that Hezekiah should have been somehow rude or indignant. He should have accepted the kindness and appreciated maybe to some degree, we could say that. But he goes way beyond that. And, in a sense, has fellowship on a spiritual level with the king of Babylon. We are to be aware of this. We are to be aware of this. We are to see a distinction between, and again, Hezekiah's prayer, all that we read in in chapter 38, he should have brought this into practice with his relationship with the king of Babylon and made a distinction, but he makes no distinction between this king and the people of God. 
Barnes notes in his commentary that a lot of the silver and gold probably actually came from the Assyrians when God struck the Assyrians dead in their camp. All the, the, the treasures would have been left behind uh, and so on. In Second Chronicles chapter uh, 32, we read in verse 27, that Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, and for spices, shields, and all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for increase of corn, wine, oil, just an immense riches. Verse 29 of Second Chronicles 32, Moreover, he provided him cities, possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much but God had not given this substance to show off to the king of Babylon the scripture says that we are not to cast our pearls before swine there is to be a distinction there is to be a difference made between the people of God and the enemies of God the people of the world another application of this for us is not to pray necessarily for a long life, but for a life in accord with God's word. A life in accord with God's word. Pray for a God-honoring life. Hezekiah's life, as we've seen in previous study, is given great words uh, that none was like him before him or after him the greatest of all the kings and yet he commits terrible sin in this folly in this foolishness and then we see thirdly the questioning or interrogation by Isaiah verse 3 then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah and said unto him what said these men and from whence came thee unto thee and Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? See, notice this. Isaiah was completely unaware of this. When Hezekiah was in trouble, he sent for Isaiah. But now Isaiah has no knowledge. And this also teaches us an important application that we're not just to seek the counsel and the prayers of God's servants in times of trouble, but in all circumstances. Because in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. If Hezekiah had gone to Isaiah and said, well, the king of Babylon has sent letters, he sent presents and so on. What should I do? Isaiah would have went to the Lord, sought the Lord, sought the counsel of the Lord and brought back God's counsel. You see, it's more dangerous quite often for the believer in a time of prosperity, in a time when everything is going well. That can actually be a more dangerous time. Beware of times of prosperity even more than times of trouble because the scripture says, um, I went astray, but when I was afflicted, I ceased going astray. It was good for me to have been afflicted. We need to beware of the smiles and the acceptance of the world. Woe to you when men speak well of you. So the failure of Hezekiah goes all the way back to this point that he didn't seek Isaiah's counsel. And the counsel of the Lord in this context. He just went with his own feelings. He went with his own intuition. Which turns out to be folly. Hezekiah answered all that is in mine house they have seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. He went with his emotions. And with his feelings. Which again reminds us there's many Christians who emphasize feelings, emotions. Go with what you think yourself. This shows the folly of such. Fourthly on this last point, God's judgment upon his foolishness. Verses 5 to 7. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the day is come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. 
you've showed, and this is justice here, isn't there? You've showed all these things to Babylon, and now they're going to be given them. Nothing shall be left. All your riches, all that you have, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, you prayed for an heir. You prayed for one, and thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. Everything that Hezekiah prayed for would be lost. They shall be eunuchs. They won't even be real men. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Everything that Hezekiah prayed for will be lost. Beware of times when things are going well. Beware of those times. It concludes with the submission of Hezekiah to the will of God. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He was a believer. He was a godly man and he knew he had done wrong. He had no argument. He had no longer any argument to bring before the Lord. He had lost his confidence by his sin. The scripture tells us that when we obey the Lord, we have confidence before him. 1 John 3, 21-23 tells us this. Beloved of our heart, condemn us not then we have confidence toward God, not that we are justified by our obedience or our works, but in our life, in our communion with God, when we're we're not living in sin, we can come boldly to God. We can have confidence. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. You see, that was the Hezekiah of chapter 38. The, the Hezekiah of chapter 38 could come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, this is my life. This is my obedience. This is my relationship to you. And on this basis, I am praying. And we can have that confidence. Again, not in any sense that we are justified by that. But in our filial relationship, in our in our relationship with the Lord as our Father, and when we're living not perfectly, but honestly before him in doing his will, we can have confidence doing those things that are pleasing in his sight, which brings us back to an earlier conversation that we were having about, can we please God? Yes. As his children, we can please God. Only his children can please him. The ungodly, even their prayers are sinful in the sight of God. And this is his commandment, 1 John 3, 23, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, which shows that the only ones who can actually please God are those who believe in his son, the Lord Jesus. Hezekiah doesn't pray because he lost his confidence. He lost his boldness before God. He knew God was right and therefore he submits to the will of God. He can't come in an argument. He just takes the pronouncement of God and he submits to it. Oh, well, may God apply these things. Many other applications I'm sure we could have mentioned, but may God help us to apply these things to our souls. Amen. We conclude with Psalm 67. And for the believer, we can always come to the Lord for his pity. We can always come to him for his mercy. Even when we have committed the greatest of sins. And therefore, Lord, bless and pity us. Shine on us with thy face, that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. The argument here is, Lord, be merciful, so that we might proclaim thy mercy to a needy world. Psalm 67, Lord, bless and pity us. Lord, bless and pity us. 
Shine on us with thy face. Let the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. Let peace Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, we we ask for wisdom in all of these things. We ask, Lord, that Thou wouldst enable us not only to seek Thee in the times of great trouble and affliction, which we will naturally or supernaturally do, But Lord, we ask that more than anything, we would seek Thee in the blessed times, in the prosperous times, so that we would not make the same error that Hezekiah made. Lord, help us. Lord, be merciful to us. Bless and pity us. Shine on us with thy face, that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. Help us, O God. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>